Now, the next two psalms that we have here, Psalm 108 and Psalm 109. Psalm 108, if you'll note, is a psalm of David. It's a very wonderful psalm. I don't want to spend too much time with it. It has caused, of course, much criticism. Some think that it's a patchwork. It's not that at all, but it's a great psalm. And let me emphasize here, O God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise even with my glory. This is Israel's remnant, redeemed, brought home, praising and exalting the Lord. We saw in the last psalm, God was going to bring them back into the land and he'd brought them from everywhere. Now they're back in the land and they're praising God and glorifying him. And verse 7, God hath spoken in his holiness and I will rejoice. Then he talks about dividing the land there and how the land will be divided in that day. It's a glorious, wonderful psalm. We'll not spend any more time with it, however. Now, in Psalm 109, you have the humiliation, actually, of Christ. It's a messianic psalm. And the next psalm, Psalm 110, is a messianic psalm. Now, these two psalms that we have here, messianic psalms, one, the humiliation of Christ, and the other, the exaltation of Christ, Now, this great psalm of the humiliation of our Lord is a very important psalm. It's actually an imprecatory psalm, and it is actually a Judas Iscariot psalm. It's been called that because this is the psalm that was quoted by Simon Peter before Pentecost, ten days before, when they elected a man to take Judas's place. Now, I'd like to read this section. It's too important to pass over. Verse 6, "...set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. When he shall be judged, let him be condemned, and let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few, and let another take his office." Let his children be fatherless, his wife a widow. Let his children be continually wanderers and beg. Let them seek their bread also out of their desolate places. Now, friends, you can't find anything that is more dreadful than this imprecatory psalm. I think it's the most dreadful of all of them. And it is applied to Judas Iscariot. There's so little attention today given to the condition of the lost. Now, as far as I know, no one is defending Judas Iscariot. I've had a notion today that there's certain organization and certain judges that would let Judas Iscariot off. The fact of the matter is they'd declare him innocent and declare Jesus guilty. But the Word of God is very clear that he's a lost man. And this psalm here makes it rather frightening, and it makes the condition of the lost frightening. It's an awful thing to be a lost man. It's said of this man that it'd been better if he hadn't been born. And the Lord Jesus, even he made it very clear that the condition of the lost is a terrible thing. Yonder in John 3:36, where he gave that wonderful invitation. There's also the other side of it. There's light and darkness. He said, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. Now, I do not know how you could make that any stronger. This teaching today that somehow or another that the folk that are lost are going to have a second chance or a larger hope, or we ought not to be squares and narrow-minded about matters like this, that God may have a way. All I know is that the Word of God says, and the Lord Jesus said, for the wrath of God abideth in him. And that wrath of God is a terrible thing. It is judgment. And he bore that wrath for us on the cross. 